In this video, I want to talk to you about and introduce you to uh, what could broadly be called narrative criticism of the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> this, for me, is, is one of the more interesting, personally, uh, one of the more interesting perspectives on reading the Bible for many reasons. Um, but it, it's something we will we will find super relevant. And in fact, I would encourage you to mark pages 245 through 49 in hearing the New Testament uh, as reference pages for when you are dealing with, <clears throat> with narratives and you're interacting with narratives, interpreting narratives. Helpful few pages there for reference purposes. Uh, but as we, as we turn to narratives, it's important to highlight what's going on here. Now, I, I would invite you, I have, I have a brief exercise I would invite you to participate in. So take out your Bible, any Bible will do, any translation, and open up the, book, open up the Bible somewhere. Just at, at random, just open the Bible, sit it down and flip it open. And you may find that you landed on a narrative. Uh, there's, a, in, in, uh, there's a good chance you landed on a narrative. And I'm not a magician or anything like that, I don't know the future, but if you did land on a narrative, it's because most of our Bible, most of the Christian Bible, is made up of narrative. Now that factor right there is something that I think most of us, if you're like me, you take for granted. Maybe you hadn't even recognized that. Why don't we have, for instance, just a list of rules and regulations? Uh, it seems like if I were God, always a dangerous exercise to think about, if I were God, it seems like I could simplify things. I could come up with a list of uh, do this, don't do that. For all time, all places, here, here are the basic rules to get by. But that's not what we have. Our Bible is mostly narrative. 75-80% of it is narrative, which is a fascinating, uh, fascinating reality, especially for a religious, sacred textbook narrative. I think there's something theologically significant about that. And it ties into this first statement I would make to you. Whatever else we might say about narrative, we have to begin by recognizing narrative is not interested in talking about what is, but rather what happens. That's simply to say it's more oriented toward events. It's primarily oriented toward action, toward things happening, not just toward general reflection or ontological reflection, existential reflection, if you're familiar with those words. But it's a reflection on actions, what happens. And the theological, uh, the theological dimension of that, and what I think is significant about the fact that our Bible is so heavily or, uh, weighted toward narrative, is that we might uh, find useful to reflect on God in terms of ontology. That is, who is God? And, and these ideas about core essence of who God is or what God is. God is love. God is Trinity, and so forth. Important, uh, by, by all means, I'm not trying to suggest those aren't important areas of reflection. But by way of reflecting on God through the biblical text, we're far more likely to come out saying, not here is who God is, but here is what God does, or what God has done. In fact, any reflection on who God is only flows out of who God, uh, or what God has done. God is a deliverer, not just as some abstract idea, but because God delivered the people of, of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is love, not just in the abstract, but because God uh, so loved the world that God sent his son, and so forth. It's always tied to action. And it's a different way of reflecting on who God is. Here is what God has done, and here is what God has done. And here's what God has done. So the fact that we have so much narrative should cause us to think about how we even think about God. So we're thinking about how we think about God. So that basic premise out of the way, then what we have to ask is, what, when reading biblical narrative, what is the primary aim, the primary interest in biblical narrative? And I would suggest to you this, that the primary aim is to interpret events according to the perspective of God. Now, all narrative is interpretation. Even if it, 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 the, the moment you try to tell a story about something that has happened, you interpret. If for no other reason in the fact that you select certain details 
certain events to tell and others to leave out. Just by selecting, you're interpreting. But most narratives are more highly interpretive than that. In the biblical narrative, again, back to the, the long dead horse that we keep beating, the issue of history and theology and scripture, the relation of those, those factors, the, the biblical text is far less interested in saying that certain things happen, though it does depend on certain things happening. But it's more interested to say, according to God's perspective, here's what that event means. So with Jesus' death and resurrection, here's what that means according to God's perspective. So biblical narrative, we're oriented toward the perspective of God on an event. Now, you're familiar with narrative. Luckily, narrative is a pretty common genre, uh, as far as narrative more broadly speaking. We could talk about the sub-genres of narrative. But narrative, luckily across time and space, there are some common features that show up so that narrative, if you read a biblical narrative, you likely don't feel too uh, out, out of your comfort zone. Uh, but in order to reflect a little more specifically on some of the things you take for granted when you read or watch narratives uh, in, in modern times that you may not take with you to the biblical text. Uh, so some of these characteristics that, again, are marked in hearing the New Testament as well as uh, biblical interpretation, uh, Tate's book. But just to reflect on a couple of these. First of all, when we're reading narratives, we have to ask about such things as the ordering of events. The way in which events are ordered, A, B, C, and so forth, is a method of interpreting events. So what I mean is this. Let's say an actual historical chronology. We had element A, B, and C. These are three events that are within one narrative. If you were to tell the story, you could simply tell A and then B and then C. But what you could also do is this. You could do C, B, A. You could start with the conclusion and then tell all the way back to the beginning. Uh, or you could do C, A, B, and so forth. All possibilities here. So when we are reading there, we have to ask, what is the implied chronology? In other words, what, what would have had to happen in history, uh, in the actual event as it transpired? And how is this narrative ordering those pieces? Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Memento, I recommend it. It's a bit of a mind, mind twister, but I, it's an enjoyable movie. But I'll highlight it in terms of ordering. If you haven't watched the movie, Memento actually begins with the final scene. And then it goes back, and it, and it continues to go over. It adds more to it as it goes along. But eventually, you get back to the beginning of the movie. Now, the, the effect of this, it's the same pieces, but it changes the way that that narrative is delivered to the readers or to the viewers, depending on the medium. So if you're reading a biblical text, you have to ask, how is this event ordered, and what effect does that have in relation to what the, the actual chronology might have been? So, for instance, we have episodes where we're told uh, that, that, uh, that certain things happened. Jesus healed this person. And then after the fact, we're told of the interaction of Jesus with that man before he healed him. Uh, in real history, it would have been that Jesus interacted with that man and then healed him, not the other way around. So we have to ask, how is the event being ordered, ordering of events? Uh, second, duration and frequency of events. How long does the event take and how the frequency, how, how often does this occur? Now, there are several ways in which uh, the, the narrative can interact with the actual chronology. Uh, I would give five. So first... The narrative can skip events altogether. Uh, so this is speeding up the actual event, if you want to think of it in that way. It's, it's sped it up to infinity. So what, the, there was a real event, someone, like let's say you get up and start telling about your day, uh, you brush your teeth, you get a shower, and so forth. Later, if you're recounting that day to someone and you skip altogether the brushing the teeth, the showering, you've sped those events up so that they're non-existent. So a narrative can skip events altogether. Uh, for instance, Matthew and Luke tell at least briefly about the birth of Jesus. Mark and John say nothing about it. 
for their narratives, then we have to ask, why are they skipping the birth? What's the significance of that for their narrative? Usually skipping means that an event is not significant for that particular narrative. So the narrative can skip. Second, the narrative can speed up. So it doesn't skip entirely, but it speeds up. So it might say, uh, for 10 years, the people did this. For 20 years, the people were, for 400 years, the people were in slavery. It's not skipping it all together, but it's speeding it up. So here, it's, the event is significant to get from point A to point B, but not so significant that we need to stop and tell all the details. Have you ever been a part of a conversation where some, uh, with, with people who don't know how to speed up? They're telling you a story about something, and they have to stop on every detail as if it's equally significant. And as you can tell, it's, it's often hard to keep your attention if that's the case. So speeding up has the effect of showing this is significant, but not ultimately significant, not worth stopping on. Third, the narrative can replicate The narrative can replicate actual time. So, uh, say a conversation. There's a good chance that a conversation replicates the actual time. If it's telling what was said, there's a good chance that that, that more or less equates to the time it took, the duration of that event when it took place, the initial conversation. So here, they're just go, they're overlapping. The narrative time and the chron chronological time are overlapping. Fourth, the narrative can slow down time. So the narrative can take something uh, that was a short amount of time, uh, but actually slow it down so that they extend it for a long time. So it might take one hour and turn it into uh, what would take, say, four or five or six hours to read if you're reading a book. Uh, and in reality, it would have only taken a short amount of time, or it's simply in relation to the rest of the narrative. It, it can do, stop and dwell on one, what in actual chronology, actual time would have been a short time period, but slow it down. Now the effect of this is to give high significance to that event by giving it more space, which is equated to time in literature. And then fifth and finally, A narrative can stop. So a narrative can stop time altogether, and again, this gives it high significance. It gives an event a lot of significance. So you can find out that time has not moved on. Maybe uh, it's stopped entirely. So as you can see from point one to point five, we really have a spectrum. And again, remember, this, these, uh, these words indicate the relation of the narrative time to the actual chronology. On one end, we have narrative altogether skipping, uh, chronological events. On the other end, it's stopping them so that it's dwelling on them infinite, to infinity, infinity. And then all the other three, they fall somewhere in between. So as you can see with narratives, there, there's a whole way in which, uh, a whole set of possibilities for how duration and frequency can, can exist. And just as a quick example, the Pentateuch, Genesis 1 through 11, thousands of years, if not billions of years. Genesis 12 through 50, we shorten it down uh, to a, a few centuries. Uh, then we get into Exodus, and we shorten it down to a few years. That's a shorter time period, a few decades. Then we get into the end of Levi Exodus, on into Leviticus and Numbers, and that, those entire books cover only months. So the real time was not very long, months. But the narrative space and time is long. This shows, just paying attention to the duration and frequency of the Pentateuch, shows that there's a high significance placed on the giving of the law, which is what we see in Exodus and Leviticus. Time almost stops at certain points. So as you can see, we have many other characteristics of narrative to consider. Having these in mind as you read narratives will help you to be attuned to the sorts of things that might be significant in the narrative, the ordering of events the time and space devoted to events, characterization, dialogue, all these other factors. Uh, so these are, will help us to see what, what's significant about narratives, what the narrative is doing as it interprets 
actual events